Joining me on the programme to discuss this further, lawyer Paul Garlick. Hello, Paul. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. So we hear, don't we, and, and I am somewhat mystified by this. I wonder if you are. If you're not, and whether you are or not, maybe you'll explain it. The, 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 the BBC, according to the Director General, has paused its investigation into the conduct, or lack thereof, of one of their key presenters, pending the police having a look into whether what this person has done breaks the law or not. I would have thought that the BBC's investigations would need to continue and they would need to hurry up and put some speed on the whole thing and that the person can be um, culpable for bringing the BBC into disrepute or for immoral conduct or for something else that, that you know might need immediate action, whether he technically broke the law or not. Well, Vanessa, I think everybody probably shares your views that the, the BBC should carry out an inquiry. It's a very difficult matter, though, because potentially a very serious cr criminal offence could have been committed here. I mean, making indecent images of children is an indictable matter, even if those images were the lowest category, category C. The starting point in terms of sentence is an immediate uh, sentence of imprisonment. So this is a very serious matter. Now, the difficulty is... The police are now investigating. Uh, they may not have actually confirmed that an investigation has begun, but I'm quite sure they are investigating. It would be gross negligence if they didn't investigate. It's a criminal investigation. Now, the difficulty now is if the BBC, if the Director General, if anybody starts to interview the presenter, and if they don't comply with the, the rules, for example, of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, anything that's said in that interview may subsequently at a trial become inadmissible. And it may also be more difficult for the police after such an interview to re-interview the presenter. So whilst, I mean, everybody, I think, would, would agree with you, the BBC should do something, they're in a very difficult position because they don't want to prejudice a police investigation and a prosecution. It seems, or it would seem on the surface, Paul, and you will disabuse me of my uh, misapprehension if I've got this wrong, but it would seem to me not to be particularly complicated, this investigation or inquiry, because certainly if the parents who've been uh, giving their interviews to the Sun newspaper who have taken the lead on breaking this story with great effect, I might add, if the parents are to be believed, they have said that there's a very discernible and traceable paper trail here, that pay payments have been made to their son to the tune of £35,000 and it can be seen and traced to whom they've been paid. They also said that they have actually seen this presenter, they said, you know, uh, scantily clad on a couch waiting for their son to satisfy his desires to see him in various kind of erotic poses or whatever it was. In other words, it doesn't seem very complicated. It seems to, to, to involve the presenter, their son, possibly only fans or some other means by which uh, people show pictures and pay for access to pictures of people in indecent poses or whatever it is. And it, and it seems as if it wouldn't take very long to work out whether it was true, whether it wasn't true, and whether this uh, young man was actually only 17 when this happened or was older. Well... Uh, there's a lot of anecdotal information going around, but that's not evidence, admissible evidence in the court. The police have now got to make sure that the evidence that they obtain is admissible evidence. They'll have to do a proper audit of the, the trails of, of evidence. They will have to interview the parents and, and see whether their evidence is direct evidence or hearsay evidence. They will obviously have to give the particular presenter an opportunity to be interviewed under caution as well. All these things um, are slightly more difficult than perhaps members of the public realise. And it is, as I said, very important that nothing's done now which could prejudice an investigation. There may also be a subsidiary investigation because there seems to be some suggestion that the presenter may have been attempting to contact the, the young man. And that may be an allegation of perverting the course of justice, which is equally is a, is a very serious matter and one which needs very careful investigation. Yes, that would be if he had done, as has been suggested, contact him and say, don't you dare tell anyone this story. This is, you know, private. Don't you dare. And I'll do X, Y and Z to you if you do. It's interesting, isn't it, that now a second young person has come forward to say that this same presenter was threatening and frightening to him when he threatened to expose that person's identity? Because then you might think there is a character trait that is that is discernible here of, of, of getting very angry and threatening. 
well, that needs to be investigated as well. And if it's if there's truth in the second allegation, doubtless that will form another charge and will be dealt with um, in the same way in the criminal courts. And Paul, may I ask you this? If it were to turn out that the law has not been broken, that, for example, this young man was, let's say, on the OnlyFans site, was over the age of 18 and therefore was plying an entirely legal trade and that this presenter was paying this young man to look at these photographs, the young man was over 18 and no law has been broken. If that were the case, would it then be unconscionable or illegal or something of that ilk for the BBC to dismiss this presenter who had not technically broken the law, or would it be entirely legal for the BBC to, 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 to suggest and to feel that this person had brought the BBC into disrepute, had made himself the centre of a, a, an enormous breaking news story with political reverberations and therefore was you know, bringing the BBC's own status under some kind of threat, um, and therefore, the BBC would be able to get rid of him or stop him presenting, even though he hadn't technically broken the law. Well, I'm not an employment lawyer, so I'm not going to express an opinion about employment law. But I would have thought that uh, gross uh, immoral conduct, such as is alleged, would probably amount to sufficient evidence for a summary dismissal. It, it seems it seems highly unlikely that such a presenter who wants his identity is established and wants his culpability has been proven could possibly continue as a presenter on um, BBC. And, and when you say culpability, so this would be, I've, I've been asking hypothetically, had he not broken the law? So you are saying to mm -hmm. me that in your view, he would be found culpable, even though he hadn't done anything illegal. So explain the culpability, which <laughs> doesn't involve breaking well, the law. Well, moral culpability. I mean, uh, one has to have standards, and um, certainly if you're a presenter on um, the national broadcaster, you have to have certain moral standards. People are not going to countenance a presenter who has conducted himself in the way that is alleged. My emphasis is alleged at the moment, but they're not going to countenance him continuing to be broadcasting to the public at large. And, and does that mean that it is reasonable I don't know, in the eyes of the law, in the eyes of the Lord, in the eyes of whoever is judging all of this, in the eyes of the, in the, eyes of the license fee payer, does it mean it is reasonable for the BBC to expect different standards of behaviour from its presenters that are different from the general population? Because I think, were we to do a, a study into you know what percentage of the normal population views porn or pays to see photographs of naked people or doesn't pay to see photographs of naked people but easily accesses such photographs from their phones on an almost hourly basis, we would probably be utterly horrified by the sheer percentage of people who do that as a normal part of their daily lives. So does it mean the BBC is entitled to require higher standards of conduct and behaviour than normal people? I don't think that's a matter of law. I think that's a matter of um, um, moral standards. I think uh, the, probably the, the most helpful way to look at this is, could you realistically expect the public to tolerate a presenter remaining in the employment of the BBC, the national broadcaster, and broadcasting to the nation um, if, if it is proven that he has behaved in this way? And that's not a matter for a lawyer, that's a matter for general public opinion, I think. That's a matter for an archbishop or the chief rabbi. Thank you very much yeah. indeed.